Welcome back. I'm Alfred Lamarmont Weber, and today we have an extraordinary guest, uh, independent scientist, Loren Murray, coming to us from Berkeley, California. Welcome, Loren. Hello. Thank you, Alfred. I'm ready for another big banging interview. <laughs> well, uh, this interview has been a long time in development and it may be uh, more than a one part interview. We'll see. Uh, and so that the viewers really uh, get the larger picture and become focused on it. We'd start like to start with the headline first. Although we know that you're going to jump us back, perhaps uh, five centuries back, I think, if my if my arithmetic is correct. Uh, and the headline will be something like Lorraine Marais, Jesuits seek to defeat all democracies, establish one world religion and government and a sole source economy. Is that something like what the big picture is going to be? That is. Yeah. So having said that, uh, could you bring in all these concepts of corporate name change and uh, world domination strategy and bring us back five centuries and tell us all about the origin of the Society of Jesus, which is a reversal on the name of Jesus. And uh, the band nefarious uh, conspiracy known as the Jesuits. Well, I'd like to start with a statement by Napoleon when he was imprisoned. And um, he had a very rough time with the Jesuits. And I, I do like uh, a lot of the things he said because he lived it, he walked it, he was in their house and they were in his. Uh, so this is a quote from Napoleon. Um, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in the most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jerusalem is the most, uh, yeah, Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign, and over the sovereign. Whenever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a, a meritorious work if committed for the interest of the Society of Jesuits or by the order of the general. And that's from a book uh, titled a Memorial of the Captivity of Napoleon at St. Helena by General uh, Montholan. So, in a nutshell, that's a very, very good description and summary of the most cogent points and the most dangerous aspects of the Jesuits. And 
And what was the context in which Napoleon gave that? I mean, why, why would Napoleon have come up against the Jesuits? Well, because they, they run the world. They run all the wars. They caused World War I and World War II. They caused the French Revolution. They caused the, the Napoleonic Wars. It's because they're in our life all day and all night long. The whole entire planet. Now, we've heard over, over the years that same phraseology applied to the City of London bloodline bankers, applied to the, uh, the UK and Dutch Crown, applied to a variety of uh, dark actors. Why applied to the Vatican? Why the Jesuits? Where, where do they come? And how do they relate to the, the parties I just mentioned? Well, they really go back to the Knights Templars who were formed and self-organized at the time of the Crusades. And, um, and when the Crusades were sort of winding down, um, there, there was a period, uh, for instance, when Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese explorer, uh, sailed around the world and, and colonized um, Asia and Africa and India. They, he established colonies for the Portuguese for trade all over the world. And uh, the other European countries were a hundred years later. They, uh, the Jesuits, and I'm sorry, the uh, Portuguese had a start on them. But in 1516, um, Francis Borgia, he was a, a duke in Spain. Uh, related, he was the great grandson of um, a a Catholic pope, but he uh, that family were crypto Jews. In other words, they were Sephardic Jews who had come to Spain and Portugal with the Moors, the Moorish people, and the Middle Easterners, who occupied Spain for over eight hundred years, and they uh, were required by the Spanish kings and queens to, um, to practice Christianity and reject uh, Judaism. And they didn't want, the Jews didn't want to do that, uh, so they were called Moranos or Conversos. They were Jews who had converted to Christianity, but they secretly practiced uh, Judaism. Now, that also happened in Japan when the Jesuits came to Japan in the 1500s and they converted many Japanese to Catholicism. Um, and because the shogun of Japan finally prohibited and actually executed uh, Jesuits who had snuck back into um, Japan when they were expelled, um, the Japanese were forced to practice officially Buddhism and, and uh, or uh, other Asian um, religions, but they uh, they secretly uh, worshipped Christ. They were secret Christians. So um, in a way, they were they were the reverse of the con conversos and the Moranos. And um, so this has gone on and on and on through history, but um, they, um, they basically established the monarchs on the thrones and kept them on the thrones because the monarchies, the nobility, have tended to collaborate with the Jesuits. And, um, and then the Habsburgs, that was a Catholic... Um, uh, bloodline that uh, ended up gobbling up most of Europe. 
But now, the, yeah, could I could I jump yeah. in here because we we sort of started it midstream. Did yeah. all of this really go back to the early 1100s? Yeah, where it was almost a false flag where the Crusades were economic but masked as Christianity. Could you go back then and yeah. really walk us through the early history and how all of this yeah. started? Well, just remember 1066 and all that. Guillaume le Conqueror or William the Conqueror, those were Normans from the north of France primarily who invaded England and took the throne and, and, and um, stole a lot of land from English landowners. And uh, they are today known as the Plantagenet, the Plantagenets. And that's what the Da Vinci Code is about, the Plantagenets. So in 1900, they stopped using the name Plantagenet, the family name, but 65 or 85 members of the House of Lords in England are Plantagenets without the name. So they still, uh, they still dominate the, the, the British and the, the British government. So um, in that sense, um, we have to go back to the Crusades, uh, which followed 1099, was the first crusade to the Middle East and it was supposedly to um, to protect the holy relics and the holy churches and so forth of Christianity um, in, in Jerusalem and, and in that part of the Middle East, even Syria, uh, Cyprus, all, they were all over the place. So, um, the um, in the first crusade in 1099, um, there were many pilgrims who went to the Middle East, but they had to carry all their valuables and money and resources with them, and there were many, many bandits and, and uh, thieves and things like that that attacked them and stole their money and whatever they had and killed them also. So, what happened in the Second Crusade is that um, the, there were nine knights and they, these, were, uh, the, these were nobility, they, they were nobles, they had, you had to be a noble to be a knight. And they, there were just five, nine of them, they didn't have any money or anything, but they came together and they were organized by, um, let's see, what was his name? Ah, Hugh de Payen. And he organized them to um, accompany pilgrims to protect them in the, the Middle East and so forth. And the nine of them went to Jerusalem and they were able to finally get official recognition from the Pope which uh, really established them, and that was in 11, uh, let's see, that was 1129. They were officially recognized as the Knights Templar. And Templar refers to the um, Temple of Solomon, which had a church on top of it, uh, or a mosque or something, but it was, uh, but underneath it in the rubble, in the, um, the archaeology below the surface, was the Temple of Solomon from the Bible. So from then on, they were referred to as the Knights Templar, of uh, referring to Solomon's Temple. Now, um, they uh, basically... Uh, were poor, but once they got started and, and people realized what they were doing, uh, huge amounts of money, property were donated to them. You can't imagine. They became very, very, very wealthy, very rich. And um, the, um, let's see, uh, they were characterized by the, the knights, had to be noblemen, and they wore those white um, 
uh, vestments over their armor with a big red cross on the front. And that indicated that they were a Knights Templar, a Knight of, of Templar. Now, at the peak, uh, they lasted about 200 years. And at the peak, they had a membership of about 160,000 across from across Europe. They also uh, incorporated the uh, Palestinians and people from the Middle East into the Knights Templar and took them back to Europe with them. Um, my last name is Moray, M-O-R-E-T. I am a Moray, a Palestinian from the time of the Crusades who was taken back to Europe and um, uh, they were, uh, they made, the Morays made the Knights Templar tremendously wealthy because they were the most educated people in the Middle East and the uh, Europe was practically still in the the Copper Age. Uh, they were out of the Stone Age but they were still very very primitive and the Morays were architects, engineers, scientists, astronomers, medical experts, um, they were very efficient administratively. They were very, very helpful. And um, Moray sur Loire is a town on the Loire River, north of Paris, just outside of Fontainebleau. And Fontainebleau was a uh, a castle that was built at the time of Hugh Capet, C A P E T. And he was the beginning of the dynasty of French kings. It was, they came from Charlemagne, and then they were followed by the Capets, uh, went extinct, and then they were followed by the uh, Valois and Henry IV, the Huguenot king, who was also King Henry of Navarre, was a Valois. And um, if if I had been alive then, Henry IV would have been my uncle. I was named for his nephew, Loren. And, uh, and then he became the first Bourbon king. And the Bourbons, uh, the Bourbon kings were very, very famous. And every uh, important royal family in Europe is descended from Henry the Fourth. Now, um, these these uh, this was really shocking uh, to find out because I thought my family were just hillbillies from Missouri. I didn't know, I didn't know my history or background. But as I began talking around the world, and I've been to fifty countries, people would come up and say, "Do you know what your name means?" Um, Hans von Spanik from the Undersecretary of the UN. We were sitting in a restaurant in Hiroshima at a war crimes conference, a genocide conference, and he was just staring at me. And he said, who are you? And he met me lots of times. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, what are you? I said, well, I'm American. And he kept asking me. And um, I didn't really know that much about my family and ties to the Huguenots and, and Henry the Fourth, but he sure did. He knew everything and he was trying to find out how much I knew. So um, we may not be aware of this, but these people, the Jesuits and everyone who's working for them, they know all the bloodlines. And the Mormons were also set up by the Jesuits. The Mormon genealogy project is to identify all the bloodlines of everyone in the U.S. for their grand plan of culling this society. In other words, they want to kill off certain bloodlines and they hate all Protestants and non-Catholics, no matter what religion you are. So. Um, so in doing work like this and research like this, it's really exciting because you learn the real history. You learn the history of your own family. You learn all kinds of things. 
in the right context to understand how this world works and how it was set up. So the Knights Templars um, were basically advanced shock troops in major battles during the Crusades. And yes. Yeah. This is what interests me. I mean, among many other things, you say there were 160,000 strung at the peak. There was a great secrecy about their ritual. They had satanic cult beliefs and practices. Yes. <clears throat> they could not marry or own property. That's and right. And they were the origin of, of, six, of 18th century Freemasonry, the signs and symbols. How did that come about? Because that seems to be the huge carryover into the Jesuits. Yes, it is, because the Jesuits are just a renaming of that corporation, the Knights Templars. I and see. So this is like a corporate rebranding. This is corporate rebranding. That's all it is. Yeah. And the, um, the Knights Templars... Um, and, well, the whole idea of doing the Crusades was dreamed up in the north part of Europe at the time, right after the Norman Conquest. So it was those Normans, it was the northern French regions that were coming up with these ideas. Uh, I should say economic schemes of land grabs and, and plunder and, and taking over countries and destroying governments and killing lots of people. So nothing is new. This is just like the Ukraine situation right now. And, and it's very related because the Crusades were set up with an economic purpose, but it was candy coated or disguised as a religious pilgrimage to save the holy sites and the holy relics of Christendom. And what the real purpose was, it was to go to the Crimea and the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea region uh, where the Silk Road ended. And the Silk Road had been in decline for centuries. So these Northern Europeans said, why don't we go back and capture it in the Crimean region and we will revive the Silk Road and divert all that revenue, that tremendous wealth into our coffers in Europe. But they had to go to the Middle East and they had to, to deal with the Ottoman Empire and, and all the other pirates in the Mediterranean in order to um, establish their scheme of reviving the Silk Road. So they needed um, soldiers, and they needed armies, and they needed a a navies to do this. They took over the island of Cyprus. They took a over another island uh, in the Mediterranean, and uh, eventually those were their headquarters. All of Cyprus was owned and occupied by the Knights Templars. Now, their greatest battle in terms of these shock troops and how they worked was in 1177 during the Battle of Montgizard, where 500 Templar Knights helped several thousand infantry, these are the lower echelons of the Knights Templars, to defeat Saladin's army of more than 26,000 soldiers. So they were basically special ops special operations. We call them SOCOM today. And SOCOM was involved in the Ukraine and the downing of Flight 17. They operated the listening posts, the communication posts for the uh, NATO fleet that was sitting offshore that ran the whole downing of Flight 17 in conjunction with the Ukrainian uh, government and military. So it's the same game. Parallel tracks, it's just a new iteration, it's a new corporate name, but it's the same game. Raiding and raping. 
Um, so let's see. Um, well, yeah. So so we're now tr tracing from from the uh, from the Crusades. Yes. And we have a significant milestone in 1139 with Pope Innocent III. Yes. Now, what happened is um, the, uh, the symbol always of the Knights Templars are two knights riding one horse, and it symbolizes poverty. Um, they had to give up when they became uh, a Knights Templar they had to give up all their property, their money, everything. They could never marry. And all of that property went to the Knights Templar organization. Um, they had to pledge celibacy and, and so forth and so on. Um, but they did have a, a very, very interesting lives and careers, and they made huge contributions, actually. Uh, the Knights Templars, with the help of the Mores, built hospitals all over Europe. They built firehouses. There had never been any way to put out fires in towns and, and cities and villages. And they um, established uh, roads and highways. And, and they, they built the whole infrastructure for Europe. And one of their biggest enterprises was banking. They set up the first foundations of banking. And so in the Second Crusade, the, the uh, pilgrims and the other crusaders who went to the Middle East were able to deposit everything that they had or owned uh, with, that they could, didn't want to carry with them. They deposited them with the Knights Templar uh, organization in the country they were coming from and they were given a letter of credit which they carried with them to Jerusalem and that letter of credit allowed them to uh, withdraw that much money from the Knights Templar organization there. So there is the very first letter of credit. This was the beginning of banking in Europe and uh, by the time, 200 years later, by the time they were at their peak, they had bigger navies, bigger armies than any monarchies or governments had in Europe, and they were richer than any of them, and they ran all the banks in, in Europe, and, um, and they had many other industries, vineyards and, and businesses, and they did everything. And... Um, so even when they were in decline and they were banished in this incident we're about to talk about, um, they still had a lot of influence at the local level. They built castles and buildings all over Europe and the Middle East, and they're still there. I've been to them and seen some of them. It's incredible to think buildings could last a thousand years, but they built them well and they built them properly and um, they, they've they lasted the test of time. So what happened is um, King Philip um, King Philip the fourth um, was uh, a French king who owed the Knights Templars so much money he realized he could not uh, pay them back. This was in about 1120. And so he pondered and pondered, and and finally he went to um, he he put out an edict to kings and monarchies all over Europe, and told them to burn all the Knights Templars and Marais at the stake, because they were perverted and satanic, and they were heretics and this and that, and then uh, they weren't very receptive because the Knights Templars had put all the monarchs on the thrones and kept them on the thrones by loaning them money. So they refused to collaborate with him. So he went to Pope, uh, let's see, which, um, Pope Innocent the Seventh, I think. And Clement the Fifth, wasn't it? Clement oh, Clement the Fifth, I'm sorry, yeah. So Clement the Fifth 
Oh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm re looking at something else. Uh, so Clement V, yes, 1307, the French Capet King, Philip IV, he was the King of Navarre also. Um, he was trying to get them burned at the stake, and he couldn't, so he went to uh, Pope Clement V, who was his blood relative, and said, you know, they're really bad heretics, and we really ought to burn them, and this and that. He put a huge amount of pressure on them, and this is where, uh, this is actually something that um, people practice today when certain people, certain groups of people, probably including the Jesuits, when they owe money to someone, they just kill them, like the Mafia does, so they don't have to pay them. And um, so anyway, um, Clement uh, investigated them, and uh, Philip IV did burn some of them at the stake. Uh, the Knights Templars and the Marais asked for refuge in other countries, and only two countries would take them. One was Scotland, because it had already been excommunicated from the Pope, and the other one was Switzerland. And that's how my family ended up in Switzerland. They were the Morays who escaped with the Knights Templars to one of the two countries they could go to. Um, the, um, the Knights Templars, now this is very interesting, also uh, the Hospitallers, the Knights Hospitallers, that was a different group, they were sort of competitors, they ended up going to Prussia. And as we know, and as what I have reported to you and we've discovered, is that the Habsburg Empire um, and uh, Vienna and um, uh, Berlin are sort of the, the, the centers of it. Uh, Prussia took the Knights Hospitallers and they were able to live there. And that is probably why the form of fascism that comes out of Austria and out of uh, Prussia is uh, rather extreme. And now it's explained why it came from those Knights Templars who reestablished themselves in those two regions. Right, right. Now, uh, there is uh, also and this ties back to the to the origin of the satanic uh, rituals and belief that the Templars were accused of idolatry and of worshiping Bahomet. Is that could, could you tell us about that? Yes. Um, well, part of the reason that uh, King Philip accused them. Of these, um, of these perverted forms of uh, cultic practices and rituals. First of all, he objected to their, their uh, secrecy and the, um, the, the hidden hand uh, that was part of their organization. If they were true Christians, many people believe they should have been open about everything, and that's absolutely true, but they were not. And um, as as King Philip brought it up, more and more people came forward and began talking about what they'd seen and observed, exactly like what is happening in response to Kevin Annette's attempts to expose the pedophile rings in the Catholic Church and other satanic practices. And, um, and so, uh, the, so the Pope finally... Uh, and this was not known until a lost document was located in the Vatican basement, filed in uh, 1600 in the wrong file. And a woman came across it. It's called the, um, just a second. It's called the, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, the Chinon Parchment. And it was written, it's dated August 17th to 20th, 1308. And Pope Clement V absolved the Knights Templars from all heresy charges 
but he disbanded them completely in 1312. And that was um, probably because he was aware of the uh, satanic practices and heresies and their following of, for instance, the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah was uh, from the Babylonian period and it was from a cult that uh, practiced magic and uh, satanic rituals and things like that. Now, that cult, those satanic cults from the Babylonian period have carried through time, through various groups, uh, to modern day uh, situations and, and um, institutions. And this, uh, these cults of, of pedophile um, practices, uh, um, satanic hunting of naked children in woods by high-level people, shooting them uh, dead, as we know has just been revealed in the, uh, the tribunal in Belgium that, that um, Kevin and Ned has been doing such a marvelous job on. And, of course, people are coming forward with the information and the evidence and the witnessing that he needs to prevail in the court. So I think people are pretty tired of this. It's, at, uh, you know, it's gone on for centuries, and it's not healthy for society. It's perverted. Um, so anyway, the Shannon parchment was interesting to find that the, the king, I mean, that the, the pope had um, uh, sort of absolved the Knights Templars, but it was the end of them. And what they did was just went underground. Freemasonry was part of their uh, operation also. And, of course, that is very, very secret. So we can see many of the mechanisms of social and political control today go all the way back to the Crusades over a thousand years ago. Yeah, but actually even further, one could argue that if you're talking about rebranding, the Babylonians rebrand themselves as the Templars, who then rebrand themselves as the Jesuits. Yes. So that's that's what's going on here. That's what's going on, and um, by uh, 1516 is when the Jesuits were first established by Ignatius Loyola, who was a um, Converso or Murano Jew born in a castle in um, uh, the Basque country of Spain and his family were Sephardic Jews, Muranos, who had intermarried with nobility in Spain. And he um, was a military uh, person. He had some kind of an injury on his horse and could not be a professional soldier a knight. So um, he started looking around for an alternative and he ended up being the very first superior general of a newly established organization called the Knights Templar. And it was funded, actually it was funded by uh, Francis Borgia. Now th this is a, a newly established organization called the Knights Templar you just said? The, I'm sorry, the, the Jesuits. In other words, called the Society of Jesus. The Society of Jesus. Now, a Borgia founding the Society of Jesus does not sound too likely. <laughs> I mean, that was a perversion of that name, correct? Absolutely. The Borgias... Um, uh, this is where all the reverse talk came from. It must be from the Borgias setting up the Jesuits because everything the Jesuits said and meant and labeled and everything after that, once they were established, the meaning was the opposite of what the symbol. Was, what, what was the opposite? So you can see yes. that if you're talking about a Babylonian Bahamut cult with pedophilia and all of that and sacrifice coming down and surfacing in the Knights Templar, 
And then, it, of course, it would be a Borgia that would found them as the Society of Jesus, correct? Of in 1516. Course. Yes. So Francis Borgia discovered Ignatio Loyola, and he said, "Huh? Oh, this is the age of exploration starting now. We need our own army and uh, good spies and so forth and so on, and we don't want them to be religious. So I'll establish the Society of Jesus." which is, um, uh, had a, um, a very altruistic, um, you know, cover on it. But he said, I'm really establishing a shock troop army that can go in and, and steal the riches from countries all over the world and people all over the world, and they're not going to want to give it up, so we're going to have to take it from them. And you do that by force. So the um, Vasco da Gama in the late 1400s, just about um, 30 years or 40 years before the Jesuits formed, um, he, um, he went on this uh, adventure to, he sailed to India and established Goa, a Portuguese colony there. Later on, he had Jesuits. They had already formed, so they went to Goa. Then he went to China. Then he went to Japan. Um, and uh, he brought the Jesuits in the early 1500s to Japan. They landed near Nagasaki in the southern part of Japan, and they began um, a missionary a uh, place there where they started converting Japanese to uh, Christianity. And in World War II, uh, because the Shogun had prohibited Christianity in Japan, the Japanese had been practicing secretly underground Christianity in the two biggest Christian populations in Japan were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, even the Japanese government, when Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, didn't know that many Japanese Christians existed. But the Jesuits did know because they had converted them. And the reason they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II was taught to stop Christianity from spreading all over Asia. They did not want Protestant Christians or Christians combining with the three biggest Christian countries in the world, and uh, that would be Germany, Russia, and the United States. So they bombed the um, Hiroshima, and then they bombed uh, Nagasaki, and there were big, uh, They, in fact, they bombed the Urukami Jesuit Catholic Cathedral in Nagasaki. And the pilot even went off course. He had secret instructions to go off of his military course, his flight plan, and drop the bomb right next to the Urukami Cathedral. So we're talking about history that's today, but it's part of yesterday and, and centuries of history with the same parallel threads uh, just changing color uh, through the centuries. But it's the same people. Right, right. So, uh, so you, you also said that Jesuits were involved in the Christopher Columbus expedition. Oh yes, the um, the Sephardic Jews and Jesuits in Portugal and Spain um, were part of the conquistadors. In fact, they were conquistadors, and Christopher Columbus. Um, was actually the son of a deposed Polish king. He was Jewish, and he was also a Portuguese nobleman, so he had a por Portuguese titles. He could have been Sephardic Jew, I'm not sure. But um, he was sent as a spy and as a, um, an agent to the Spanish, Spanish court of Isabella and... Who was her husband? Um, Isabella and, and, and uh, I, Ferdinand. For Ferdinand. Ferdinand, right. For, yeah. Ferdinand. And so uh, Columbus's job was to convince them 
to um, to fund this uh, trip to the East Indies, he called it. And it's because the Portuguese already had the western side of India through their, um, their colony at Goa, but they wanted the east side also. And the Spanish also, Isabella and Ferdinand, also wanted a share of the spice trade in, uh, the, in the Southeast Asian region. And so Columbus convinced them to fund his expedition and he led them to believe he was going to the east side of India, the continent. But what he was really doing was going to the East Indias, Indies in the uh, Caribbean. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And he went back uh, to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand with gold that he'd found there and stories and new animals and fruit and probably took some of the natives back and he said here I found the East Indies Indies for you so uh, Portugal would like to sign a treaty with Spain that they would get the west side of India and Spain would get the East Indies but what he was really giving them was the Caribbean right <laughs> so uh, so at this time, then, the you 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 talk about the uh, the Jesuits and the Habsburg co countries, and yes. really being very aggressive. Yes. Now, what happened at, in this period is that the um, the Habs Habsburg dynasty um, established itself in the. Vienna, uh, the Vienna region, that area. And while monarchies waged their war on battlefields to acquire land, um, the Habsburgs waged their wars in bed. In other words, they intermarried and intermarried and intermarried with families who owned um, kingdoms and countries and, and um, whatever, uh, in, uh, even small uh, pieces of land that were in strategic places. And they acquired this huge empire bigger than, um, it. I don't think it was as big as the Roman Empire, but it was very, very big for uh, much of Europe. And they... Um, they became tremendously wealthy, but, but Alfred, none of the dynasties, none of the bloodlines um, that were on the throne lasted more than 200 years because uh, uncles were marrying nieces, first cousins were marrying um, uh, aunts and uncles, and, and, um, and by the time uh, of the, the 1700s, um, each of those lines would, would go extinct because they couldn't breed anymore. They were so full of um, defective genes and, and um, uh, they, they didn't have babies that, that survived to, to adulthood or they couldn't conceive. All these physical problems started happening. And if you look at paintings of the Habsburgs, you can tell they have... Uh, real long jaws, very elongated heads, and and um, one of them, I think it was Charles II, he was the king of Spain and Austria and, and um, the when the empire was really big. But recently, a university in Germany uh, did the DNA and tested the lineage and the genetic uh, damage to 3,000 Habsburgs. And what they discovered was this poor Charles II, um, he had the genetics, the genes of someone whose um, mother and father were brother and sister. Oh. Which now, they might have been. <laughs> now, um, where the Rothschilds come in is with the Habsburg Empire. And... Um, Amstel Meyer 
their name originally was Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, but he changed it to Rothschild. And he was uh, born to um, in the, the Jewish ghetto of Frankfurt. And on uh, the street was called Hoot, um, um, Hudenstrasse. That's right, Hudenstrasse. And uh, his family, he bought a big house, and the Schiff family moved in with his family, and their children began intermarrying. So Schiffs are Rothschilds, and Rothschilds are Schiffs. Right. Now, you, what, what you've noticed is that this Babylonian sect, who became yes. the Knights Templar, who became yes. the Jesuits in 1516, their superior generals are all from the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire. That's what, correct. What do you attribute that to? Except that we have one now. Technically, he's from Argentina. No, but he's but he's not the general. No. No, he's he's no. the pope. That's right. Yeah. And so the um, the the superior generals of the uh, the Jesuits have always been. Sephardic Jews and or uh, born in some part of the Habsburg Empire. And the reason is that the Habsburg had a lot of Jewish blood, the Habsburgs, and the Rothschilds were the house Jews or the Huden Judah, the advisors to the Habsburg uh, monarchs, emperors. And also, um, the Rothschilds got their start in the 1700s, mid 1700s, when Meyer Amstel Rothschild arranged for King George of England, who was fighting the rebellious colonies in America, um, he secured mercenary soldiers from the Prince of Hesse, which was part of the um, the Habsburg Empire and so this is where the Rothschilds uh, made their first money on that mercenary army the um, the the German soldiers lost the the, the uh, English king lost and the colonies in America became the United States in 1776 now an, an independent self-determination democratic government selected by the people this was in complete opposition to uh, the divine right to rule which the Pope felt he had the divine right to rule over everybody uh, in the world and um, the the Americans and many other uh, religious uh, groups looking for freedom of, of worship uh, left Europe and the diaspora went all over the world to these countries or these these lands that had been discovered by these explorers but they were not populated so it was a way to pump a lot of people from Europeans into countries and secure tremendous wealth through mineral resources, uh, fur trapping, um, all kinds of things, slavery, um, anything that would make money to take back to Europe. So, so with the with the Declaration of Independence and the and the Constitution and the winning of the of the Revolutionary War. The United States of America uh, then became a special target of the Jesuits. Why is that? Well, the Jesuits um, are not Catholic. They're not a religious order. They pretend practice it, but they they have a relationship with the Vatican. And when you really dig into the Jesuits and into the Vatican, 
the Vatican is not really practicing a religion. It's, re it's practicing world domination. And they work together. The Jesuits um, are sort of, uh, 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 sort of an army, but they're not completely integrated, although the Vatican uh, Bank is where the Jesuits and other wealthy illegal organizations launder their money. Right. Now, but the Jesuits still had a, a fundamental role in the starting of the United States. <clears throat> Didn't they? I mean, uh, the the uh, Jesuits. A lot of the land on which the on which the the United States was founded in Georgetown, in Washington, was owned by the Vatican and by and the Jesuits. Yes, and that's why it's called the District of Columbia. Yeah, the thing with Columbia on it is um, it's kind of a Jesuit stamp. Um, uh, or, or fingerprint, and so they had to be here to set up the United States so that it would go in the direction they wanted it to go in and they would have control of it. Of it, and, and so that's why the three city-states of uh, Rome, London, and Washington were set up to sort of drive that satanic matrix. Is that what we're dealing with? Yes, that is exactly what we're dealing with. Now, what happened is, because the U.S. was established in 1776 with a constitution uh, declaring all men equal elections so that the government was chosen by self-determination, popular government, it's the people's choice for what candidates win to serve in the government. And um, by, uh, the, the, uh, by like the early 1800s, not even 40 years after the U.S. was established, the Jesuits were already very concerned and knew they had to stamp out and kill the United States before it spread to other countries that were outside of Europe that they didn't have so much control over. And so they, um, they had three uh, secret, very top secret congresses. And it, they, one of them was, the first one was in Vienna, 1814 to 1815. Then there was one in Verona, 1822. And that's where the secret treaty of Verona was written and signed by all parties there. And there was a third congress in Chieri, Italy in 1825. Now, the secret treaty of Verona is between Russia, Prussia, France, and, um, let's see, Russia, Prussia, France, and, and uh, one other country, um, I'll think of it. Anyway, Metternich uh, wrote, the, wrote that treaty. He signed it for Austria. Nessel Ruda signed it for Russia. Um, I've forgotten who signed it for France. There's one more country. Um, anyway, uh, though that treaty um, established that they would set up a fund and they would fund, um, use that fund to kill, to destroy with a military any democratic movement in any of those four countries and also in any other countries in any other part of the world that didn't even exist yet. So that was the beginning of all of these uh, puppet um, dictators that we're having. We've had this history of them for hundreds of years. And um, it, and also the number one purpose for those three Congresses to, was to set up a mechanism and the rules uh, for destroying the United States completely. 
because we had a constitution and a democratically elected government. Now, go ahead. Yeah, so then uh, I was just going to say that one of their first steps was to eliminate the history of the United States, wasn't it? Yes, and if you look at U.S. history, there's a period of about 40 years, starting somewhere around the 1820s, around the time of the, this, um, this secret treaty of Verona and these three congresses. And for 40 years, there's nothing. The real history is gone. It just doesn't exist. It's not in the record. It's been removed. And that was done by the Jesuits to hide what they were doing. And no wonder in 25 years they assassinated or attempted to assassinate five US presidents and the first one was Andrew Jackson and Andrew Jackson said no central banks in the United States we will not let the British banks in um, boy did he have a tough fight and he had a fight because the Southerners, a lot of them were Catholic and a lot of them were controlled by the Jesuits. Um, but he was determined, he was a very good military general, he was very experienced, he knew what he wanted and he was charismatic as well. So he prevailed and he prevented a central bank and it was a biddle who tried to get the central bank in? Then the, uh, this is the this is the Biddle family from yes, Philadelphia. Thanks. Yes, correct. The Biddles. Yeah. Yes, and the second problem he had, the battle that he lost, was that another Southerner wanted states' rights in addition to federal rights. And what that did was set up the states in a constant war against the feds. And so um, if the states didn't like what the federal government was doing, they could just make up their own rules and say, well, we have the right to states' rights. And so that very badly undermined the, um, the, the, the federal government. And it's been a problem ever since then. It means that any state can secede from the union if they want to. Well, how can you keep a country together when you have people like the Jesuits operating in secret and they've opened the door to dismantle your union of states? Do you see what they did? Right. And so um, they did not kill Jackson, but uh, William Harrison uh, was elected. And in his election, his inaugural speech, um, he said, this country will have no divine right governments. So don't even think about that. It's not going to happen here. We have a constitution that prohibits that. And that's what got him killed. He was dead 35 days after he was inaugurated and his doctors killed him with arsenic, with leeches, with all kinds of medical treatments that weakened him until the arsenic killed him. Now, the poison, poison is the preferred instrument of assassination for the Jesuits. They love poisons. And so they killed uh, William Harrison. Uh, he was... Um, part of the, um, uh, the, the, the battles of the, of the uh, new country and, and land grabs and so forth. Uh, Zachary Taylor was next, and he said in his inaugural speech, uh, we will have preservation of this union. It will not ever be broken up. We won't allow it. That got him poisoned with arsenic. The next president was William Henry Harrison, who said in his inaugural speech, we will have no divine right. Um, what? No, I said um, Zachary Taylor. <coughs> Zachary Taylor 
uh, was completely for preservation of the Union, and so um, he was poisoned with arsenic. The next president um, that was attacked was James Buchanan, and it was over the slavery issue. Now, when the colonies were formed under the British, slavery was prohibited. It was abolished. It wasn't allowed ever in the United States. And a small group of, um, of I think, Jews, yes, they were Jews, in Rhode Island at Newport, at Newport um, I think that's in Rhode Island, uh, they introduced, they changed the laws, they infiltrated the government, they changed the laws, and they made slavery legal. Um, the um, younger sons who did not inherit uh, land, they were aristocrats, uh, mostly in Ireland, Anglo-Irish, uh, reported by Cromwell by giving, giving them huge um, um, estates in Ireland for helping Cromwell in England. Um, they, uh, because they didn't inherit land, it's uh, the law of primogeniture, so the oldest son always in England and Ireland inherits the land and, and everything, the family money. So the younger sons went, came to the United States or to the colonies and they settled in the southern states where they could have big plantations, but they needed slaves to run those plantations. And so that's where Newport and Mobile, Alabama became full of basically, they, they were probably Jesuits who were at, at Newport because they are slavers. And, um, and so slavery was introduced to the United States, but because we have a constitution and, and um, people were uh, concerned about that issue, uh, human rights and so forth. Uh, slavery became an issue early on in the U.S. and um, Buchanan uh, wanted to abolish slavery but what he did was he pretended to the southern states that he supported it to get them to vote for him. As soon as he got voted in he switched on them. So um, he ended up on the um, <laughs> the Jesuit assassination list, and he had a table reserved at the National Hotel near the White House, and um, he was going there for dinner. Well, the Jesuits were going to assassinate him, but they didn't know where he was going to sit, and they did know like 65 people or 80 people would be having dinner with Buchanan that night. And they knew that the southern gentlemen drank coffee in the evening after dinner, but the northern gentlemen drank tea and rarely drank coffee. Um, so um, what they did was they put arsenic in all of the teacups, making it look like sugar, or they put it in with the sugar, and none in the coffee cups. None of the southerners died. 35 of the northerners died from that arsenic. Wow. And um, uh, James Buchanan, all of those presidents after Zachary Taylor knew the Jesuits were going to try to poison them over these issues. And so Buchanan told his doctors what was wrong with them and how to counteract the arsenic poisoning and they saved his life. But 35 of his guests died at that dinner and nobody wanted to eat at the National Hotel after that. Um, now Lincoln, of course, uh, was attempting to abolish slavery uh, and the Jesuits and the British uh, engineered the Civil War to stop that. They wanted to balkanize the United States into little little countries so that they could put their banks in all those countries and defeat Lincoln that way. So um, the Jesuits planned his assassination. Lincoln knew he was going to be assassinated. 
uh, because he'd read what Henry the Fourth said about the Jesuits, and Henry the Fourth said right from the beginning, he was he was a Huguenot, but he converted to Catholicism to become the first Bourbon king, and he knew the Jesuits go were going to assassinate him. Well, the Jesuits first assassinated Henry the Fourth's mother, the Queen of Navarre, because she opposed his marriage to a Medici. Then um, he had a woman, an aristocratic woman uh, he was in love with and they had four children together. She was pregnant with another one um, and his uh, wife, um, uh, he was married to uh, a Valois, the, the dynasty before the Bourbons and he um, couldn't get along with her and she hated him so they um, the, the Pope dispensated that marriage and dissolved it and he was going to marry this woman the love of his, of his life and uh, the Jesuits poisoned her and then so then he had to marry the Medici and as soon as she was crowned uh, he was actually on his way to her coronation to be crowned as the Queen of France and a Jesuit murdered him in his carriage on the way to the coronation. Mm. So um, the Medici mother became the, um, um, she was the, what's it called? Uh, she uh, rules until he... Regent. The, yes, yes, she was the regent until he was old enough to rule. But you can see they love to poison people. Um, and so... Um, also, when they decided to poison Lincoln, on that same day, they planned to poison William Seward, the Secretary of State, and the person they sent to his house stabbed him, uh, but he survived. Uh, they they um, attempted to assassinate Ulysses S. Grant and the Vice President of the United States, Andrew Johnson. So, you can see how absolutely crazy they are and absolutely obsessed at any price uh, with accomplishing their goals. Right, right. Now, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of this segment because I think that, that uh, this, this is going to be a two-part program and, and we're and, and what we're focusing on is how this Babylonian, uh, satanic, Mahomet, uh, uh, pedophile uh, uh, cult rebranded itself as the Knights Templar and then rebranded itself as the Jesuits and how they have gone through history and with a special emphasis on what they did to the United States as sort of the first major democracy to declare itself as constitutional and sort of uh, I, and so we've gotten up to their uh, five presidents in 25 years and we haven't even gotten to the presidents in the 20th century uh, uh, and uh, so, and in the 20th century, of course, and per per perhaps we could cover that, uh, John F. Kennedy. Oh, absolutely. Um, he was another one. Waco, World War I and World War II, um, the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic. These all have to do with banking, with power, with politics. Um, and with anything that was perceived by the Jesuits as getting in the way of their goal of world domination. Yeah, be, because, for example, the false flag of the sinking of the Titanic, that was key because it eliminated some of the opposition uh, to the establishment of the, quote, Federal Reserve, which was a private, uh, which was, in fact, a, a public, uh, bank that was privately owned, uh, where the United States would have to pay money to the uh, to the uh, bloodline bankers to have 
its own currency that was provided for in the Constitution uh, to have its own money printed. <laughs> well, nobody said they're fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this has been now. Uh, uh, so, how how is it uh, now? So then that brings us up to the to the uh, to the to the Civil War uh, with Lincoln, the Russian Czar, the Southern States, the British, their role with the Jesuits, uh, the French. Uh, could you kind of give us the, you know, sort of the, the, the geopolitics of that situation? Well, what happened is that um, the Civil War was engineered by the British. Uh, the Jesuits, actually, the British were the, um, the glove on the hand of the Jesuits. And that was unsuccessful, even though uh, Lincoln was assassinated, uh, our nation survived. The way that Lincoln was able to win was he knew he would lose if he didn't get military assistant, assistance from other countries. He sent a letter to the major countries of the world, to the governments, and said, please send military assistance. Uh, my country is in trouble. Uh, one leader responded, and when Lincoln's letter arrived in the court of the Russian Tsar in the 1860s, before the letter was even opened, the Tsar of Russia said, give him anything he wants. And the Russians sent warships that sat off the west coast and off the east coast to blockade the British from interfering in the Civil War. And because of the Tsar, our country has had 150 more years of peace and freedom in our country. I'm not talking about all the countries we've attacked all over the world because we're a permanent war crimes racketeering syndicate with the British. but we had prosperity and many wonderful things have happened because of the United States and in the United States and uh, by Americans, many contributions. But uh, that would not have happened if the Tsar of Russia had not sent his ships, his warships to protect the United States. And the Tsar's family was assassinated by the Bolsheviks and something like 85% of the Bolshevik leadership came from Brooklyn, New York. They were not even Russians. And um, they, uh, a lot of them um, had Jesuit ties and so forth. And um, the, uh, they, they would have destroyed the United States and we would have balkanized, we would have been, uh, I don't know what would have happened, but we wouldn't have been a country, a union anymore. And what's happened now is they're very close to achieving that goal in the United States. And we'll talk about that in the next interview. But uh, we have to always thank the Russians and the Tsar of Russia for that great contribution to the history of the United States. And I want to say that the United States and Russia have always, always been very good friends. And they always will be. The three strongest Christian countries in the world, Russia, the United States, and Germany, have always been good friends. Now, sort of one final question on this part. Yes. Um, and it's this. It seems uh, so improbable that a Babylonian, a secret Babylonian, satanic, pedophiliac, 
uh, assassination cult would have gone through the ages to surface as the Knights Templar <clears throat> and then to resurface as the Jesuits and with such vast, uh, vast, vast tentacles throughout the world that you've described so far, had it not been for their hugely deceptive name as the Society of Jesus, taking a name that to many billions is the holiest of names and making themselves the Society of Jesus. Many people believe that Jesus is an incarnation of a divine principle or a divine personage. So what are your observations on that? Well, it's called semantics. <laughs> and the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party practice it every single day. Family, the world family, the word family to the Republicans means this and this and this. The very same word to the Democrats means something completely different. So all over the world this actually happens. Um, but it's semantics and it's to fool the people. It's to use the same word but give it a different meaning. For instance, God we call God uh, a higher power. It's a place of holy worship. It's about our spirituality. But to Jesuits, God has an asterisk after each letter. It's gold, oil, and drugs. It's just semantics. Semantics. Well, um, uh, next week will be... Uh, excuse me, in part two, we'll be following up on this headline. Lorraine Murray, Jesuits seek to defeat all democracies, establish one world religion and government, and a sole source economy. What thoughts would you like to leave our viewers with for part two? Well, we've looked at the roots and the origins and the paper trail that lead up to the beginning of the Jesuits. And, um, and in our next interview, we're going to look at how it's affected our world, the world we live in, and how it's changing it and what is being done to us. And um, you can't really understand that without understanding the deep history. It's called deep time. And it's well worth going back and looking at the origins, what we've talked about today, because that's how we got to today. And that's why we got to today. And that is what is happening today. It didn't happen overnight. Well, I, I really want to thank you, and we're very grateful for all of the uh, uh, ingenuity, uh, insight, uh, hard work, and research that you put in this series on the Society of Jesus, a.k.a. the Jesuits, and we eagerly look forward to part two. So thank you. you uh, thank you, Alfred, and just the comments that people have made, the the letters they've sent and the emails, um, I know people very much appreciate these difficult topics that we're covering and the horrible truth. But until you know that, you can't counter it. You can't um, even figure out what the forces are around you. You're in a virtual world on puppet strings that you can't see and a puppet master you can't see either but we are very controlled and if we want self-determination if we want to be free if we want free speech we need to know who the enemy is and how to counteract them and many countries have expelled 
the Jesuits forever from those countries. One of them is Russia. There have almost never been Jesuits in Russia. They can't make it there because the Eastern Orthodox Church won't allow them. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, we'll pick up on this topic in our next segment, which I'm sure will be a great revelation to us all. Thank you very, very much, Alfred, for all the things you've taught me, all the opportunities you've given me, and all the, the travels and, and wonderful projects we worked on. <laughs> and that are just beginning. <laughs> they sure are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Lorraine.